thinking sideways. I don't understand. Does not compute. You never know. Insufficient data to formulate on this line. What? Stories of things we simply don't know the answer to. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Thinking Sideways. I'm Steve. As always, I'm joined by my co-hosts. Devin. And Joe. And once again, we're going to look into uh, kind of a big mystery. And we're going to solve it. Yeah, I don't know about that. But we've gotten a lot of listener requests for this particular story, and we finally gave in. We're going to do it. We've also gotten a lot of listener requests for longer shows. So just keep in mind, this is what you asked for. Yeah. (laughs) It is going to be a long one because, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the Voynich Manuscript. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. And a lot of people have probably heard of the manuscript, but we're going to go through all of the details and you're going to be really surprised at how much there is. Uh, To give it a basic overview, the Voynich Manuscript is a book which is written in an unknown language, and it's full of illustrations. Or maybe a known language, but... We don't know what it is. But an unknown... Alphabet. Alphabet. That's possible. That's possible. Sorry. That's okay. Or maybe a strange code. It could be a strange code. Let's start with the history and talk about the book first. Probably the simplest place to start. Probably the beginning, the best place. Mm -hmm, Okay. The book itself, it's called the Voynich Manuscript because it was... Purchased by a man named Wilfred Voynich in 1912. But it's been around for several hundred years, and we know some of the history, or people guess at some of the history. And we'll, I'll just d- dive right into the history. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere between 1600 to 1610, it's believed that the book was owned by the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II. Mm-hmm. And this would, this would, by the way, be well over 100 years after it was created. Well, according yeah. to the theories that of the age of creation, yes. So yeah. this, is, this is a partial history. So this has passed through it, a lot of famous hands. It has. Yeah. Uh, from there, it left uh, Emperor Rudolf II's hand and was owned, well, theoretically, by his imperial distiller, uh, a man by the name of Jacobus... Tepensk, which yeah. is an easy name to say. Super easy. Yeah. It ends in a CZ, so I think... I, I nailed that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> between 1630 to 1645, they think that a German bohemian alchemist named George Baresh owned it. Mm-hmm. 1645 to 1665. It's believed that it was owned by Johannes Marcus Marcy of Cronland. Yeah, wherever that is. Yeah, yeah and I'm, I, I tried that to figure not, that, that out. That might actually be a store, not a country. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I went to the local Cronland. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he, uh, he actually, it was, I, I read about this. He was friends with George Baresh, and when Baresh died, he willed the book to Marcy of Cronland. The oh, store. okay. Yeah, and apparently he was friends with, uh, with, with Mr. Kircher. And Baresh had actually been in correspondence with Kircher because he thought he felt that Kircher had, had, the, had the smarts to actually decipher or break this code. Oh, you're right. I remember reading that. Yeah. Wait, wait, who's Kircher? He was a very bright guy. <laughs> 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 anyway, but, but so he, he actually, he actually hand-copied sections of the books of the book and 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 wrote to Althanasius Kircher twice mm-hmm. with these and asking him for his input and Kircher wanted the book itself so he could mm. look at it and and Barash was never willing to do that but then when he died he willed it to his friend Johannes Marcy and of Cronland the store and uh, <laughs> he wrote to him who almost immediately gave it to to to, to Kircher. To Kircher, because he felt like Kircher was the only guy who'd be able to make heads or tails out of it. That so, okay, so. that that explains the gaps that I couldn't yeah. I couldn't yeah. quite pin down. So Kircher, yeah, you know, wound up and wound up with it. I guess it was destiny. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Destiny. Yeah. For the next couple of centuries, we're talking two hundred and fifty plus years, we don't know where it was. 
it's believed that the Jesuits had it and that they moved it around Europe from place to place. Why or how is unknown. Well, they're pretty good at keeping records. Yes. At, at saying, we don't know if this is important or not, but it looks like it might be, so we're going to just go We'll just hang on to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll just put it in the back things. corner. Yeah. That's one of those things. I could imagine myself just rooting around in my basement two boxes and like, oh, well, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, like, oh. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. I was I was down in my basement the other day this last weekend doing a little house cleaning and getting and, and going through stuff and I found stuff I'd totally forgotten I ever owned. And, <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh wow. It's yeah. the joy of having a basement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, let's see, from there, uh, as we said, nineteen twelve, Wilfred Voynich uh purchases the book. We don't know where he gets it from, or I don't know. I know he purchased it, but I, mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly I, I where he, he got bought it. it. I believe he bought it in Italy. Did he? Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll run with that because I can't remember exactly where. When he died, he gave it to, he, I believe, willed it to his wife, Ethel, who then gave it to a woman named Ann Nill, who then sold it in 1961 to a man by the name of H.P. Krauss. In 1969, Krauss donated it to Yale University's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. So Yale has it. So Yale has it still? today. For now. Okay. They still have it today. Yeah, for now. Yeah. So that's <laughs> and that's where it is. That's where they're, they've they done a great job of getting good photos of it and making it available yeah. to everybody. But it's a mm. several-year-old, te- 100-year-old text, so we don't want everybody leafing through it Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's under lock and key. But but. I think it is available if you go in and you're a researcher of any kind. I know they've made it available to certain forensic scientists. They have. You've you've got to have the credentials Mm -hmm. to prove that you can get to it. You and I couldn't just walk in there and ask We have the credentials. (laughs) I think it's sideways. But the thing about it is is I've I've looked at their photographs of the the, the book online, Mm -hmm. and it's it's very clear, and it's, you know, you can zoom in. They're really great. Yeah, Very high quality. You can zoom in. They've done a really good job. high detail Mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. 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 All right, so we've talked about the history that we think we know. That we're fairly sure. That we, of, right? Yeah, we're fairly sure. Okay. Uh, people believe they figured it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, folks have tried to pinpoint where it might have and when it might have been made. Mm. And some of that they've done based on characteristics that are in the text itself. Let me just run through some of that. Uh, so it has what they re- refer to as a upright handwriting style that's reminiscent of Carolinian minuscule which evidently was in use from 800 to 1200 or it's uh there there's another it's it's Italian how do you say that Joe Quattrocento okay yeah. which i guess is called the the humanist hand which was from 14 to 1500 and the radio the carbon dating kind of puts it in that range as well uh, people have also said that the drawings have parallel hatching and hatching is when you you draw a series of lines to infer shading, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is similar to, you know, one of the first guys that really did a lot of that is Da Vinci. If you look at a lot of old drawings, Mm -hmm. that's how Mm -hmm. he gave depth and shadow as you crosshatch in there. Yeah. Uh, So people think that it could have been from his era, which would have been, if it was made in Germany or that style came out, it would have been in Germany at around 1410. If it was made in Florence, it would have been 1440, or if it was after 1450, then it could have been anywhere, because that style Mm -hmm. had Mm -hmm. gone across Europe. It had gone viral. Yes. (laughs) But so that's a pretty good, solid, like, you know, 60 or 70 year old window, right? Yeah, for Mm. for the cross-hatching, yes. And for the... the, uh, kind of matches with the hand style for the italian yeah for the italian Uh hand handwriting style yes it does okay but we've also got some things uh some people who have owned the book have made notes in on it and in the margin and that handwriting seems to be done in the style of the 15th century so we're looking at the the 1400s and there's some of the other notes that are written on it and this is primarily notes that are in the zodiac section Mm -hmm. Uh, that style of handwriting people have pointed to say is from the southwest of france so Uh, there's a lot of different places that it could have been just based on these basic facts Mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of hard to figure out yeah so it's uh it's a it's a manuscript Mm -hmm. and so it's like a book yes right and it's um, 9.3 
inches by 6.4 inches by 2 inches, right? Oh, so, so it's yeah, 2 inches a, thick. So it's 2 inches thick. Yeah, so not a big book, though. I mean, no. It's like, not yeah, a huge book. It's not like one of those massive things you think about from, you know, like, like Which 2 is by silly 3 feet. Because you look at the pictures and they look really big. They do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah. kind of blown up, but it's a little book. Um, but it's, it's hundreds of vellum pages, and vellum's pretty thin paper material. It's kind of see-through almost a little mm-hmm. bit, too. So it's possible for there to be a lot of pages in a small amount of space, Mm -hmm. i.e. like old books, old Bibles, things like that. You see it on paper like that. Um, Paper's valuable, so you gotta you gotta use as much of it as possible. Yeah, and you know make it as condensed as possible. So they're collected into eighteen what are called choirs, which are those little like fold like folded areas right We've it's like this, this. The, you know when you, when you look at a, a traditionally bound book you mm-hmm. know, if you look at it from the top you notice that you it's have in, sec- the little it's in sections. sections yeah, yeah. Those, and those are folded over and stitched together mm-hmm. and then stitched together in one big book yeah, yeah. those are the yeah. choirs right yeah. each one mm-hmm. of those each one of those sections yeah so uh depending on how some of the pages are folded or things like that uh or how you count them i guess it's about uh, 240 pages in total Um, there's some numbering in the right hand corners of the right hand pages, which pretty much everybody agrees was done by somebody who owned it. So this is one of those people who after the fact owned the book. Yeah, it wasn't done by the person Mm -hmm. who did it, but who was kind of maybe archiving it. You know, they owned it. They were like, okay, we should probably number these pages. It might be they kept dropping the book and all the choirs would fall apart. You didn't know what order to put them in, you know? So he started numbering them. Yeah. So they, they are numbered one through 116. But there's some number gaps, so people think that it's it's probably more like 272 pages originally altogether. Yeah, because there there are missing pages, and we don't know what's supposed to be on them. Right. And then Wilford Voynich, as we mentioned before, acquired the manuscript in 1912. And there's there's a lot of strong evidence that all all the different choirs have been kind of reordered. So people kept time. rearranging it the way they thought it should go. Mm-hmm. Is is that is, yeah. am I understanding how that that's correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I okay. mean, you know that, or that again, you know, you drop a book and you're like, I, I don't remember yeah. where everything mm-hmm. goes. I'm just gonna shove it back in. You yeah, know, it's been around for so long. It's just quite possible it's been rebound yeah. several times and it's, it's kind of fallen apart. So, um, you know, interestingly, you know, if there's missing stuff, you know, and since it used to be in the hands of the Pope, it'd be kind of cool to go through the uh, Vatican's li- all their archives and see if the missing pages are there. Even yeah, that would be yeah. interesting. Yeah. Lots of similar letters to the Vatican. Dear Vatican, this is Open Sideways, the <laughs> podcast. I'm sure you've heard of us. Surely. <laughs> yeah. We're Pope Francis' favorite podcast. Yeah. Um, Clearly. So anyways, back to the story. Oh, sorry. Um, so based on modern analysis, uh, we pretty much know that it was written by a quill pen with iron gall ink for the text and the figure outlines and then colored paint. Kind of like watercolor, color paint. Yeah, right? it's kind of watercolor. Was uh, applied to the figures, um, and the book has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, so the early 1400s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. kind of corresponds with what we were talking about with the history of it as well. Mm. Okay. okay, so I'm sure you guys want to know about the text itself. So it's it's clearly written from left to right, uh, and so it's, it's got a pretty pretty straight left margin and a kind of a ragged right margin, which is what to be, is to be expected. Mm-hmm. So that gives, uh, means it's probably more likely European than Semitic in origin. Some of the longer sections are broken into paragraphs, and some of them actually have bullet points. They're, they're shaped, shaped like stars or flowers. And uh, there's no punctuation. And I've noticed this myself going through the text. It's like there's no obvious punctuation in there unless certain characters represent a period. But then we'd you know, I'd be seeing them consistently, and I'm mm-hmm. not seeing that pattern. There's no indications of errors or corrections. So there's no no words that have been crossed out. There's no... You know how you, you do that little thing where you write the word above and there's a little V up pointing up to you know to where yeah. it's supposed to go. None of that. Yeah. None of that going that, on. And and for as long as this text is, mm-hmm. that's amazing. It that is there amazing. Is no yeah. corrections. But I feel like that a lot it happened a lot in those days, but you just like wrote it and rewrote it. You used the paper as like mm-hmm. could, right? I mean Yeah, I don't know how quickly Vellum absorbs uh Ink either, but I you know. But from looking modern at this, vellum uh, sucks ink in pretty quickly. Really, as I say, it now might... I don't know about you know four hundred years ago mm-hmm. how it was, yeah, but old, I know that yeah. it it pulls it in pretty quick. Yeah, well, the, the old timey stuff. I was just wondering if the the ink takes a while to soak in, and if you have to have a moment to wipe it off if you make a mistake and then mm-hmm. rewrite it. You I might be able to blot know. it up, but, but I think know. you know you would see that you'd see the yeah the you of that, would though. and yeah. books back then were 
all handwritten. Uh-huh. Yeah. They didn't have the printing press or right. anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think often you see books that didn't have, I mean, some of them did have mistakes in them, but some of them didn't. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the intriguing things about this manuscript is that it, you know, assuming that it is a real text, it maybe suggests that there are other versions of it or there were other versions. Well, of yeah. It. I was going to say to have written it enough times that you didn't make any errors mm-hmm. anymore. Back in the day when monks would write the Bibles and they would each just sit down and, ma- and make the same page over and over and over. Yep. Mm-hmm. You had to write that thing a lot of times. But to here's get what it I'll right. tell you is that having a job in which I often write the same thing over and over and over again. It's always like the 50th time that you make a mistake, right? It's never like the first time because you're like on it. You're like, I got to do this the right way. You're really paying attention. And then it's like after you feel like you've written enough times that you like (laughs) have it is when you make the mistakes. You get comfortable. Yeah, you get comfortable. Yeah. That's why so, you got to do the old cut and paste. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what I do in my job. A yeah. lot of boilerplate in my reports. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Okay, back to the text. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no, Tangent. that's okay. okay. I do it to you all the time, so no worries. It's true. Uh, so anyway, no indications of errors or corrections, and that might be significant. I'll um, talk about that later, but... I'll hold you all in suspense for now. <laughs> We're going to talk about that after the commercial. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there are over, over 170,000 letters in this text. Uh, they call them glyphs. Uh, and there are 35,000 words of varying length in there from a couple of letters to about 10. They're very simple sim- uh, pen strokes for the most part. So the words seem to follow like a phonological or orthographic law. This is linguistic stuff that I have a hazy understanding of. But mm-hmm. Meaning that certain characters appear in each word, like vowels, for example. You, know, you can't write an English letter without a word without a vowel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so some vowels are going to just have to be there. Uh, some characters never follow others. Some always follow others. There's been a couple of, and that I've noticed just from perusing the text that always seem to go together. Mm-hmm. There's like, like a, a Q and a U. Q and a U. There's yeah, exactly. In this text, there there are two letters. Then they might just be a single character too, but it looks like an L and an F, and they always follow each other. And so it probably is, or it could just be a single character. I don't know. But so the uh, characters seem fairly simple, though. Mm-hmm. I think you know, yeah. right? They're two. Yeah, they're not. They're not the ornate. Most. Yeah, no, yeah. not at they, all. Uh, yeah, they are yeah. in one way, but in not another way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, characters. Some characters always follow. Some characters never follow other characters. Some can be doubled or tripled even, but others not. Mm. Some words only occur in certain sections, and some occur throughout the manuscript. And I've noticed this too, even though I haven't read the whole thing. I spot. I sort of hopped around a little bit and looked at various pages. And, and I've noticed some words that appear a lot in some sections and not in others. So, and that maybe possibly has something to do with the subject matter of the section. I'm mm-hmm. not really sure. Uh, there aren't a lot of repetitions among the labels that are attached to illustration, the illustrations themselves. Even though there's much repetition in the text itself, there's not in the labels. Which suggests that they're actually labels. Oh, uh, probably. Yeah. So, and, and as Joe was kind of saying, there are different sections. There are actually six different sections. And this is what we, we've defined it as six sections. Yeah, they're fair. I think, you know, as Joe was saying, they're, they are fairly distinct, uh, at least with the illustrations. Um, and I think that's, you know, the one thing that we can kind of know about this manuscript is we don't know what the words say, anything like that, but we can look and say, oh, the drawings in this kind of group are all the same. So we're going to say this is a section. So the, the six sections, uh, there's an herbal section that has uh, drawings of plants, uh, most of which are like really unidentifiable or kind of almost like impressionistic paint drawings of And these. do you say that because of the coloring, the way that the colors are applied? It's not the, just the, the coloring, but that they're also kind of stylized? abstract. Yeah, stylized, I think, is probably the best one. Okay. Or it could be that it was they were drawn by somebody who couldn't draw. Who couldn't draw. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. would be interesting because it would mean there were multiple artists because mm-hmm. some of the other drawings are like really Summer good, good. Yeah. really great. Then there's the astronomical section, which uh, has illustrations of the sun, moon, stars, and zodiac symbols. The so-called biological section, which is kind of the most interesting and fascinating one, because it's um, got some weird kind of anatomical drawings with small female human figures populating systems of tubes and transporting green liquid from place to place. Yeah, some they of also those... have a oh, lot weird. of 
Christian symbology mixed in with them and they look really European. And then we have the cosmological section with mostly circular drawings that are kind of, they've, they're, they're so far, they're unexplained. To me, it looks a lot like video game maps. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like different worlds in a video game map. Like and they're the... like, there's bridges in between some of them, but not others. And mm. they're all kind of circular and weird. I don't know. That's just what it looks like to me. Uh, there's the pharmaceutical section, uh, which is, it's called that because it has drawings of containers, which often have small plant parts like leaves or roots next to the containers hmm. and a uh, recipe section, which consists mostly of like lots of short paragraphs, um, that have like weird star drawings in the margin. So okay. it's definitely worth the time to go out and take a look at the pictures. Indeed, and yeah. and they're 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 fascinating. I I think we might have mentioned this already, but they believe that the color was added to later. the illustrations later on. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the the research points out that they believe that they only had four. I think it's four colors available. Yeah. So every time there's a blue. It's the same blue, whether it's it's thinner or stronger to make it lighter or darker, mm -hmm. but it's always the same blue or the same green. So they, they didn't have a whole lot of colors available, which makes sense because you have to mix, you had to mix color by hand yeah, at that point. You, you crush find... the same berries. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not easy to make. So you use all of it and mm -hmm. you just make as much as you need. You know, what, one of the things about the drawings and everything that kind of makes me wonder is that... Uh, as, as you know, paper was probably pretty scarce back in those days. Mm -hmm. I sort of wonder if somebody uh, somebody was like making these sketches. Somebody else came along and, and needed some paper to write on, and just and just basically wrote around these uh, around these drawings. <laughs> but it was completely unrelated. <laughs> and and then you know, somebody else came along later and did a little coloring, treated them like coloring books. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always possible. Yeah. Anything's possible when it comes to the Voynich Manuscript. It, it, well, yeah. it really is. And that's one of the, just as an aside, you know, you, we talked about the history before, but it's amazing how long people have been puzzling over this thing. Some of the people that, that like like Mr. Marcy that we talked about earlier that wouldn't turn it over to, what's his name, Mr. Um, Kirch. Mr. Kirchner, or Mr. Kircher, uh, he spent 20 years yeah. kind of trying to figure mm -hmm. this thing out. Yeah, Some people currently have spent longer. Yeah, yeah and it yeah. is perplexing. And, and the illustrations are interesting because typically there's one illustration per page. Mm -hmm. And as Joe was alluding to, it takes up the majority of the page. And if if we look at the plant one specifically, it's typically the entire plant from root to tip. So mm -hmm. it's maybe they have a flower drawn here or there that's kind of a highlight section, but most of it is just that one plant. And then and that's why people believe that they're the the text is about those plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the other the other illustrations of the women that you were talking about before a little more. Perplexing, I think, is the word to use there. Well, is it, is I, it what I have the heck a they mean? Really good explanation for that. that yeah. I know we're going to get to. Yes. Yeah, yes. we got to get to the series later. Let's, let's 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 talk really fast going through this the description period. Yeah. Because I know what people want to hear is all these jazzy, cool theories, and then they want us to solve this mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, my friends, is kind of the basic description of the Voynich manuscript. Again, I strongly encourage you to go look at pictures if you haven't already or look at more I'm, pictures. I'm sure they're doing it right now. Because it's, uh, it's you can't describe it with and, words. And it's, it, it is worth it to find the sites that have A, lots of the images, and B, high quality versions. Because if you look at them in, say, a news article, because there's been a lot of news articles about it lately, mm -hmm. it doesn't do it justice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's when you get one of those ones that you can zoom in multiple times and really see the detail. Yeah. That that's when it really kind of gets in. It's really intriguing at that point. Wait, this isn't just some crudely drawn thing. Mm -hmm. There's actually some decent detail in there. It's really interesting stuff. That, yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, obviously, we all puzzled over it, but it's really Really interesting nonetheless. Yeah. But it is that time, as always, where we go into everybody's favorite part, which is theories. Yay! Yeah. And I've got the first theory. Let's hear it. So our very first theory is that 
The Voynich Manuscript was written by Leonardo da Vinci mm-hmm. in a private language. None other than Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. Might as well yeah. start off with the, the, the top. Mm-hmm. Work our way down from there. <laughs> I, gotta, I, gotta say, I gotta say from the start, though, that Leo was a better artist. Yes. Okay, so e- here's, here's the thing. People think, the folks that subscribe to this theory, they believe that da Vinci wrote this when he was a very young man. Maybe a teenager or just starting his career, but he hadn't really developed his system of... Of drawing, so this is very early on. So it's it's kind of, it would be like looking at somebody who was in the Cubist movement, but looking at their early works when they were trying to figure out how to draw in a Cubist way. It's not as developed as the rest of his work. You just art nerded out. I did. I totally art nerded out. I can't <laughs> help it. Good da point. Vinci was known for writing in semi-coded ways. He made what is, you may have heard of mirror script. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what it is, is that if you took a piece of writing and you held it into against a mirror, right now you can't read it. But if you wrote it as if it was that mirror image, it looks like utter gibberish. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You write, most people write, and they're writing tips to one side. The letters flow to the right in English, typically. So if you were to start writing it from right to left, and everything go the other direction... We should qualify. It's not just English. It's anything that uses... The European, yeah. yes, European. It uses the Gregorian the, alphabet. Right? Yes, I believe that's the proper phrase to Is that use. The right. But so, uh, but, but uh, speaking of his mirror script, so did, did Da Vinci use a mirror, or did he simply learn how to write backwards? He learned how to write backwards. Okay. So he perfected it so that he was writing it the wrong way. He was also known for writing with his right hand, but he was initially a southpaw. He was a lefty. Mm. And in that time, if you wrote with your left hand... You were the devil. You were... It was a sign of the devil. And Mm. anybody who wanted to write left-handed learned to write with their right hand. Yeah. He rebelled against that later in his life and and went back Mm -hmm. to using his left. This theory, which is primarily advocated by Edith Sherwood. Mm. She believes that this was something that he did when he was first learning to use, to write with his right hand. How so, young is she saying that he would have been? I mean... Late teens, early 20s I is just, the impression I got. The thing that I... The problem I have with this theory is that, first of all, the drawings don't look like Leonardo da Vinci. Not they don't. They you don't. know, I mean, you, you can say, well, it was an early version of him, but they... The thing about artists is it always kind of looks like that person. You tend to have a style. Yeah. There's inherent things that you do. Particularly in that time in his life, he would have been much more advanced than this. It's also been pointed out that because of the cross hatching that is used, mm-hmm. some of the hatching, believe that it was he wrote it with his right hand mm. and he drew it with his left, mm. and the hatching flows in the direction that he would have done it with his left hand, which is from right to left. He would have gone up or down, but it would have been done. It's done at that yeah. angle. Whereas if I, if I sit down and do hatching mm-hmm. with mine, it's going to flow towards the upper right hand corner. And this seems to flow towards the upper left hand corner, I see. Okay. which, so she says he wrote it with his right hand. So that's why the script doesn't match most of his notes. Mm. Mm. It also doesn't have as many, it does have similar flourishes that he wrote, which a flourish is you can cross your T or 12 year old girls love crossing their T and drawing a line up and putting a little heart at the end. Mm-hmm. That would be a flourish mm-hmm. uh, or so, dotting your eyes with a, with a heart. Yes. You know. Those, those kind of things or anything that is beyond what is needed to make it a little prettier is an easy way to think of what a flourish is sure. for. Um, I mean, th- this whole theory, I agree. There are holes in the theory. Um, well, it, and and here's here's what I really really found to be the issue is okay, I could see that maybe he invented a language, the drawings don't match, but let's just say he was goofing around. Okay, so he he was just doing it in a different style. Maybe he was drawing with the pen in his mouth. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but the problem is. Da Vinci was known for drawing little things into his drawings, and there was little codes, evidently, that he would put in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once people start grabbing this, they start seeing what they want 
in the images, in the illustrations. Yeah. And suddenly it's there's little spikes off the edge of a leaf. And suddenly people say, oh, you see that? That spells Leo if you connect the edges. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 mm-hmm. seeing what you want to yeah. see. And well, that's that's where it, I, at first I thought this I was like, wow, this is really cool. This kind of makes sense. And then it just all it went it, to shambles on. And me. you know, it it makes sense for me when we look at the like the maidens in the bath, for instance. Mm-hmm. I can see how somebody could say this artist evolved into Leonardo da Vinci. The plant stuff, though, is really what trips me up because it's really awful. Like, yeah, it's crude. I mean, just to put it bluntly, it's, it's it, there's crude. no, it's very crude, right? Yeah. There's no perspective or anything like that. So unless we're saying, yeah, da Vinci did this when he was like seven years old. Possible. And then came back and wrote it when he was 20. I'm not buying it. Okay. I'm just not. <laughs> well, and there's so many plant drawings in here that it's about that, right? I don't know. Well, don't here's, know. here's the other thing is that uh, Da Vinci left behind a lot of paperwork, lots of drawings, mm-hmm. lots of writings. Yeah, he's and prolific. Not one, yeah. you know, so if he had invented a private language, he wouldn't have let it go to waste. No. A lot of his papers, would, there would be stuff around. There, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's why there's examples of his mirror script, because he did a bunch of his notes in uh-huh. mirror script. So exactly. we know that he, he had, did that. If he had mirror script, why would he... I mean, if he had this, why would he do mirror script? Exactly. You know? No, no point mirror script might have been easier. And, and let me... Uh, I'll, I'll defend it for a second. Uh-huh. Let's say that he made this up. He made this, this secret language of his own, this mm-hmm. written language. And then he realized, I want to send a letter... To Antonio, but Antonio doesn't know this language, so he can't read it. Whereas if he sends it to Antonio and it's written in mirror script, Antonio knows to just hold it against a mirror and read what's in the mirror. And that's much simpler for other people that you're corresponding with. For other people. Uh, True that, but you know, if you really want to encrypt something, and Leonardo was not that dumb. (laughs) He knew that, he knew that, uh, you know, I mean, he knew that that's a, the the most easily crackable cipher ever, and you know of all time so if he was truly interested in keeping secrets from people other than just maybe he just learned how to write backwards just for a novelty kind of thing i kind of think it might have been yeah there's yeah. something to inter- he probably did it on a whim to entertain himself and then just yeah. kept running with it cuz he was a bit obsessive he really would it seems like mm-hmm. based on the things he came up with in some of his writings he would just keep working at it which is why he came up with some very phenomenal things yeah, but yeah, I think he a didn't lot let of, it go i think a lot of geniuses have that obsessive oh, part of their personality yeah, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and so yeah, but he did some good stuff. Well, anyway, let me let me talk about another theory, which is that it's a cipher. <gasps> yeah, you and love I'm, ciphers. I know yes, you ciphers do. are fun. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not the one that came up with this theory. <laughs> so, oh, this guy came up with what I think is probably one of the most bizarre um, encryption algorithms of all time. <laughs> so this guy, his name was uh, is William Newbold. He's a professor of pol- philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. He cracked this code, uh, which involves anagrams of 55 to 110 characters, uh, and he found the characters not actually not actually in the words or the letters themselves, but in fluctuations or, or variations in the in the edges of the ink in the letters. So by finding little so by finding little wavy little wavy things in the letters by looking at, at them through magnifying glasses. Wait, so let me let me make sure I, I because this one was weird. I read it yeah. and I thought I got it, but you you have a better handle on it than I do. So if I were to take a felt tip pen mm-hmm. and just draw a line yeah. on a sheet of paper, and exactly. the, the ink's going to bleed out, and it's going to go going to do it irregularly, right? And so yeah. you're saying he then looked at that irregular edge. And that's how he deciphered it. Apparently, that's my understanding of how it works. And uh, Weird. and then and then so there's information co- co- contained apparently in those little irregularities. And then he converted that information into into letters, which were themselves anagrams, which had to be rearranged <laughs> to, to, to form a coherent message. For for what yeah. two hundred and seventy two pages? Yeah, exactly. Worth of well, it wasn't that it wasn't oh one hundred and seventy. Thousand character anagram, no, but it was like anagrams of between fifty five and one hundred ten letters, and so it's like as an encryption uh, technique, it's I can't think of anything more unreliable. I uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Or, or difficult. Uh, so it's bizarre. But there are other people who have thought about. It. I mean, there are people all over the web who who believe that this is actually a cipher. 
um, there was a guy named John Manley in 1931. He wrote a critical paper about Newbold's theory, and uh, he did go. He did point out, as I just did, that the, the unreliability of anagramming for cryptography is is just you know it just totally shoots a hole in the whole thing. And nobody, nobody does ciphers with anagrams, right? I mean, like no, that's not no. that's not a real thing. That's a thing you do when you're like in second grade and you think mm, you're cool. Yeah. If you're actually trying to communicate information to somebody, you don't just rely on, oh, you're going to be able to totally rearrange these words into mm. the right word, well, particularly you, in a language like English, but in other languages too. If right? you have, I think, if you have a like a, a friend who's like you know, and you're both. Totally, really a geniuses at anagrams, and some mm -hmm. people are. Yeah, not me, but some people are. Uh, then I suppose you could actually communicate doing that. But you know, for most of us, it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that, that's an so, issue. So, uh, as far as it being a cipher, if it is a cipher, it can only be one kind of cipher, and that is a substitution cipher. Because if you look at this page, this is from page seventy-five of the manuscript. If you look at the two words that I've underlined. Oh yeah. They're identical. Correct. There's three of them on this one page, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right, so if it's anything other than a substitution cipher, then if, say if it's some really sophisticated kind of cipher, then the odds are that, say, an eight-letter word are going to be translated by the sophisticated, say it's a, say it's a one-time pad, that the, the, the encoded text is going to be the exact same word, especially three times on a page. Uh, statistically, that's just not possible, or it's possible, but it's like infinitesimally small odds of that happening. Mm. Unless it's a name. Yeah, well, unless it's a name. Like yeah. it's the name of a city or something like that. Yeah, well, I, I don't think in this particular case it is. I'll no, you, I, I, on that particular why, and I'll page of the folio, later, but, it's not. Uh, but. but so anyway, uh, the as you guys know, uh, I don't know if we've mentioned it before or not, the NSA actually had their hands on this thing for a while, and they were, they were they, they actually noodled it around, tried to make some sense of this, and they were not able to. But if you look at this, that word has to be, a, since the word appears more than once, this can only be a simple substitution cipher. And so for our listeners who don't know any, you should know if you've been listening to us, but I'll tell you what it is. It's a word where a letter or a symbol represent, is represented by another letter or symbol. Uh, so, so in other words, A would be D, uh, B would be F, C would be X, D would be M, like that. So it's not that, not in any sort of pattern. And then you substitute those letters whenever you, you substitute one for the other. Uh, and so if the NSA had, had their hands on this, and it quite obviously is a substitution cipher, if it is a cipher at all, then they would have cracked it in about three minutes. Not No, not three minutes, 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So They it, do have some big brains that so, are really into that stuff. Yeah, so it cannot be a cipher as far as I can tell. Okay, well, we'll move on to our next theory. Yeah, this is pretty exciting, actually. Yeah, well, what would you what would you title this theory? Is I would title this theory "Stephen Bax has solved the mystery." <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, we we were lucky enough to do an interview about this with a gentleman who has been in the news lately by the name of Stephen Bax, but let's let Dr. Bax introduce himself. Yeah. Okay. My name's Stephen Bax. I'm a professor of applied linguistics in the University of Bedfordshire in, in England. And uh, my particular interest in the Voynich manuscript is to try and decode it from a linguistic point of view. I mean, others have looked at it from a historical point of view or looking at the pictures and so on. But I'm particularly interested in looking at the language and the script and trying as best I can to make a start on decoding it. Because the problem with the manuscript so far has been that since it was written round about perhaps 1420, 1430, no one's been able to decode anything of the script or understand anything of the language. So that's the angle that I'm taking, really. So Dr. Bax has obviously done a lot of research uh, on the manuscript. Highly qualified guy. <laughs> Very qualified, yeah. I would say. Probably yeah. almost as qualified as us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit more. Yeah, we could be gracious oh. on this one. Oh, okay, yes, very, fine, very uh, gracious. But I, I did, uh, it was really interesting to find out what got Dr. Bax to first start looking at the manuscript. It was kind of like a random happenstance. Yeah, well, it, it, well yeah. Well, I was listening to the, the radio uh, about two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, and there was a really interesting program about John D. And they think he might have been the model for the, the character Prospero, in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, a kind of mystical, strange, wizard-like figure. And he was uh, really interesting. He tried hard to speak with angels 
and communicate with angels. He had a large library of different books. And it was thought at one time that he might have owned this manuscript and then sold it on to um, the Emperor Rudolf II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, because we know pretty sure it did belong to the Emperor at one time. But it's now thought that actually John Dee didn't have much to do with it. But I got into it by looking at John Dee, listening to a program on the radio, looking at Wikipedia, as of course we all do, and then <laughs> finding the Voynich, the Voynich manuscript from that and thought, wow, this has got some really interesting signs and symbols, some of them looking a little bit like Arabic letters. Because I've studied Arabic for so many years, that really intrigued me, and that kind of got me going on it, really. As we were talking to Dr. Bax, what I really wanted to kind of key in on was what exactly was it in the text that jumped out at him that he first started looking at and working on. Yeah, kind of his aha moment, right? Yeah, it's exactly right. His like, aha moment. Yeah. That's, that's the important piece. Mm -hmm. That's the first piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I mean, the very first one was I found a, a pattern which seemed to be the repetition of, of what looked like A-R-A-R. -A -R. And that kind of pattern in the manuscript is quite rare. So I thought, well, that might be a borrowing. And it seemed to me to be alongside a plant which I knew to be um, was called the Ar-Ar -ar plant in Arabic, which is the juniper plant. So it struck me that it might actually be the name of that plant. Now, I'm not entirely sure that that's, that's correct anymore, but... That kind of got me started on looking for the plants and particularly the first word on each plant page. Because in medieval manuscripts, that's usually where the name of the plant was. The first word was the, the name of it. So then I started to look at other ones. And um, besides that, there's a really interesting picture on page 68 of the manuscript, which has a, a big circle. In the middle, it has a face of the moon with a rather sad, gloomy face actually drawn on it. Beautiful little picture. The top left-hand corner, there are seven stars, which people reckon are probably the Pleiades, the seven sisters, in the constellation of Taurus. So I took somebody else's idea, which said that the word alongside these seven stars might be the word Taurus. And basically, I split it up into the letters, thinking the first one's probably a T, the second one probably an A, the third one could be a, a W sound, because of the, the old form of Taurus is Taur, and the, third, the, the fourth one would be a R. And that kind of way, then comparing that with other words and other names of, of the um, plants, it seemed to me that there were some patterns come, going on which would you know, help to lead us to a fuller decoding later. But I should just emphasize that at the moment it's still provisional and it's still very, very small. I mean, when I tell people I've deciphered 10 words of a 35,000 word manuscript, they <laughs> usually fall, fall off their chair. But the point is nobody's ever done any before at all. So I suppose even one word, if you can say with confidence, and that's kind of something. The key thing from, from my point of view is to look for proper names. And that's partly because previous um, analyses of language, for example, the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphics in the 18th and 19th centuries, that was the way that they did it. They looked for proper names like the Pharaohs, Ramesses, or Cleopatra. And once they thought they'd found them, they, they worked out each letter, for example, Kle or Pato, they worked out each letter and the sound related to it. And so they built up a system of sounds and signs. And then from that, they went on to find out that, in fact, that particular language was related to uh, Coptic. So the, it, they started with proper names. And I thought it would be useful to try the same approach with the, the Voynich manuscript. And people have tried similar things before. But I think partly my background in um, other Oriental languages, such as Arabic and other languages with different scripts, gave me a, a kind of handle on which I, where I think helped me to get, you know, make some progress on it. But you don't have a Rosetta Stone, do you? <laughs> well, no. I mean, that would be the beauty of it. But unfortunately, we, we don't have any other manuscript or any other um, text of any sort with the same letters and symbols as the Voynich manuscript, which is one reason why it's so fascinating. It's the only text in the world which has these letters and symbols. But it has a lot of them. I mean, there are 35,000 words in the text but we can't read any of them, so it's very frustrating as well. And so we asked Dr. Bax about uh, some theories that perhaps the language that is in the document, in the manuscript, is the written alphabet or the written language of a dis an extinct language. And here's what he had to say. Well, the extinct thing, I, I didn't actually say that. I, I mean, what I suggest is that the script might, has definitely become extinct because no one else has used the script. But ah. the language underneath, the language underneath could well be a language that has, has modern descendants or could be a, full, a fully existent modern language. Um, I mean, if you take, let's take the example of Armenian. Let's imagine that it might be Armenian. 
Well, um, you then say to yourself, why, if it was the language was Armenian, why would they write it in a different script when there's a fully formed Armenian script they could have used? So in other words, it must be some group of people who had to devise a script for themselves because there wasn't a script already there for them. And some people have suggested, interestingly, that it might be a Romani, a kind of gypsy language, which also has interesting um, Indian roots, because obviously the Romani tribes are supposed to have come from India and migrated across Asia into Europe. And that's quite an intriguing idea. I'm not saying I believe that idea, but it's intriguing because, of course, they are a group who didn't have their own script, who would have had to develop their own script if they wanted to um, encode all of this knowledge that they had. And then arguably, you could argue they might have been, that group might have been suppressed or died out and their knowledge and their script died out with them. But yet still we have the Romani language around, which, which we could use to interpret it. And that does actually have a bearing with uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Eventually, Egyptian hieroglyphs were shown to encode the Coptic language, which existed but had been suppressed for many decades and didn't have its own writing system. So there are kind of parallels which make you think it could be something like that. So one of the, the places that we ran across Dr. Bax, he's kind of all over the internet right now, was his Reddit AMA that he did, Ask Me Anything. And one of the theories that was floated in this was that it may have been written by this Italian explorer, Niccolo De Conti, and his uh, Indian wife and children. He was Italian, his wife was Indian. And it the, the the flourishes look a little Hindi to me. You know, I, I, I really like this theory. So I asked Dr. Bax about it, and he had something kind of interesting to say. Yeah, I like that theory too. I mean, I like the idea that it's kind of made by a, like a family. or I, I really like that idea. But the problem is that if we jump too quickly to identify an author, we tend to block out other possibilities. And I think, you know, the, the idea of your, your, your kind of podcast being thinking sideways you know, I think we've got to kind of keep our minds open and be aware of all kinds of possible things. But I do like that particular idea about the, 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 the Conti idea. I mean, lots of people assume it was written in Italy because it was found in Italy and because some of the script looks a little bit kind of Latin. But my personal idea is that it was probably a little bit further east than that. And I, I would, you know, be looking in the area of um, kind of Turkey, the Caucasus, um, Western Asia, that kind of thing. But it does have, the thing is, if you look at the pictures, there are a lot of the pictures are very European in their style. There are lots of European female figures. There's some European clothing in there. There's some interesting European-looking buildings and so on. But when we say European, it could equally be kind of Near Eastern, Turkish, Armenian, Georgian, that kind of area. But I think that's kind of more likely than a, a purely European origin, mainly because the words that I've, brought, I've managed to identify seem to have more of a kind of Near Eastern, as you said, Arabic Persian basis, rather than, for example, a Latin basis. So that's kind of where I would uh, kind of go for it at the moment. Obviously, Dr. Beck has invested two years of research into this. He's not just going to let it drop. So he is going to continue to, to look into the manuscript, but he's got some really creative ideas on how to keep doing that research and how to get some help with that research. I've, as I say, I've got my, my website, stephenbax.net, which is I'm making it more into a forum for people to come in and, and give their ideas. Of, of, and so we've got a, a kind of areas for people to look at the plants and give their ideas, areas to look at the stars, and some really interesting contributions now about the star names in the manuscript. And I think that's a good next source for information where we could actually go and try and, I mean, it, again, typically in those days and also now, a huge number of the star names that we, we have come from Arabic originally. And uh, that, I think, could be a good source. I don't think that the names in the Voynich manuscript are directly from Arabic, but I think many of them may well be derived from Arabic. So again, that could be another source of helping to identify maybe some new letters, some new sounds, and so on. So that's what I think is a really exciting area. To, but my problem is I'm very ignorant about plants. But I'm very ignorant about stars. <laughs> yeah, so, so am I. I need, I need a lot more people to kind of chip in and help with their knowledge and say, no, that's, that's a good idea, that's rubbish, and so on. Yeah, crowdsourcing is a great way to go about solving problems like well, this. Well, it is. So. I mean, you, you know, you get a lot of people who basically say, oh, I, I, you know, maybe this is crazy, but maybe X, Y, and Z. 
you say, well, you know, all ideas are on the table. We might as well look at them. And even if it, you know, you think it's crazy, let's put it in the pot and see where we can go from there. Uh, okay. At this point, we've gone on quite a bit, of, quite a bit of time, and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have to pee. So we're and we're, we're only to... halfway done. Exactly. And, and so we're going to have a short intermission for your convenience. And we're back. So this next theory, Dr. Bax actually directed us towards... Hey, thanks, Dr. Bax. Thanks, Dr. Bax. Very nice of him. Uh, he directed us to a article in a mag- magazine, no, periodical, I think it is, called the... Chronica Horticultura? It's Latin. Mm -hmm. And the article is called... Biological Section of the Voynich Manuscript, a Textbook of Medieval Plant Physiology. Question mark? Question mark. Physiology? Mm. So this theory goes... Well, okay. This theory is put forth by two doctors, Dr. Tiaz and Tiaz. I think they're married, but they might be siblings. I gotta be honest... I don't know. I couldn't tell. They're, they have the same last name. It may actually just be a coincidence. They just might have the last same last name. Doctors Tiaz. Can, can I say that? Doctors Tiaz? Doc- I think that's doctors. appropriate. The Doctors Tiaz. Yeah. The this, doctor and his companion. It's, it's a theory. Thank you for the nerd reference. It's a theory based on the plants, too. Just like Dr. Bax's theory. Uh, but they their goal is not to decipher the words, but to tell us what the manuscript, or at least the section of manuscript, is about a textbook of medieval plant physiology. They claim that you can't actually identify any of the images by the plants, which, sorry, Dr. Bax, is kind of true. They are hard to identify. And again, this is something we talked about, is Mm. the illustrative quality or accuracy is not high. It's Yeah, they're they're very, it's simplistic. And it's hard, you know, the 15th century plants were a little different back then. We don't really know. They were kind of misshapen and had no perspective. (laughs) (laughs) No, but we don't know where they're from, right? So we can't even say like, well, plants in this area at this time were these were kind of like, well, in Europe, in the maybe 15th century, the plants were kind of maybe this. And these are the ones that we know were in medieval and it Europe. it vaguely yeah. kind of looks like this one, so it might be mm-hmm. that one, right? Mm-hmm. So they say, that's, that's what's not important. They want to talk about the theory to explain the nude women in the green tubs. Um, and the Tia's theory is, is totally radically different. It claims that this explains how plants get their nutrition. So this is this is truly, and I know the name said this, but this is truly a biological plant physiology yeah. book. So yeah. this is saying how nutrients go from the roots to the tips. Yeah. So so mm. bear with me, right? As as I'm sure most of you know, right? Because you passed second grade. Plants <laughs> get. I didn't. But... <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Plants get their nutrition from the sun and the ground, right? And from the air. And from the air. Most of it is through water, nutrient-rich water that they suck up through their roots Mm -hmm. and then kind of digest using the sun. That's like the most simplistic way that I can describe what happens. Yeah, the sun powers the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Tiaz and Tiaz suggest that since this idea would have been really new in the 15th century, this manuscript was developed to kind of explain it to people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Except they, they sort of slipped and wrote it in a language nobody well, understood. Well, um, you know. <laughs> so the, that maybe the manuscript was um, meant to, and I'm quoting here, delight, entertain, and instruct the reader. And the women would have represented the souls of the plant. Now, you might be wondering, why so many souls per plant? Because it would ostensibly, you know, be one plant per page, right? Mm-hmm. So Aristotle actually has a really good answer for this. He said, you know, way before this manuscript was ever made. That plants are chicks? No. (laughs) (laughs) That plants have a lot of different souls. What he said was that when you cut a human or animal in half, they die because they only have one soul. 
So you cut their soul in half, their soul dies. But wait a second. Has anybody ever tried rooting a human being to see if you can actually, you know... Good question. Yeah. We should probably try that next week. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to volunteer? Uh, no, no, I think we're going to find an outside volunteer for yeah. this one. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, I'll so work on that. We'll just go with the theory that when you cut a human in half, they probably die, right? Uh, Normally. Yeah. yeah. But when you cut a plant into half or many different seg segments, it'll live for a while or forever. Sometimes forever. Huh. Sometimes they can kind of regenerate. You know, you replant it. Well, yeah. Exactly. Take cuttings. You take yeah. Cuttings you take cuttings and you, have, and you replant you, it yeah. and it becomes a new thing. So it follows by ancient kind of theory that that plant must have many souls you look super angry and confused i um, i'm confused i'm 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 following this this is not in my wheelhouse <laughs> mm. I, i'm you following have to it kind though. of think it, ancient times and older... and that's that's where i'm having the yeah. difficulty you're is having a hard I'm, time regressing yes I'm, yeah. I'm 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 following the logic you're such a higher being yeah. that you're having no yeah. it's just <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's, just uh, it's 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 such a different mode of thinking yeah it's, yeah. An, it's an allegorical depiction of, of how the plant works basically you know? but, yeah uh, yes. the, the problem i would have with this is like for example the one one that i can think of where it there's this plant-like structure, and it's green, and there's all these naked women. But if you look, you know, going, and they're not, it appears from the picture that they're not going up the plant from the soil to the top of the plant. It mm -hmm. appears that they're sliding down a water slide into a pool at the bottom. They're going well, the wrong direction. The souls might be going the wrong direction, mm -hmm. but the yeah. water might not be. Yeah, maybe. But, I don't uh, know. But again, I think, the, the, Joe, I think you're having a bit the same issue I am is that we understand that in a plant, in, in a biological perspective, it everything rises from the roots mm -hmm. up. And they don't Whereas they be... may not have had that perspective, and so they, they viewed it as going down. Or circulation. Possibly. Or, yeah, yeah, it could have been yeah. a circulatory system. Yeah. So the, the other thing um, about this TS theory is they talk a lot about the large amount of Christian religious imagery through the manuscript. Um, they point specifically to, again, the biologic section with these women. A lot of them are holding what can kind of be identified as rosaries. There's one woman holding what is clearly a cross. Um, and they've looked at illuminations or really closely at one of the sources they cite is if you look really closely at the head of us of one of the sunflowers, there's a cross in it. You know, okay, okay. I, I got I, I need to stop you there mm -hmm. because this is the same thing that I had an issue with with this being something by Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. And remember, I said people thought they saw his name written in things in kind of a, a hidden way. Mm -hmm. I looked at that image and. It's happenstance to me that it looks like a cross. You have to infer the cross into that plant. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I was drawing that and I knew how the, the seeds were going to radiate out, to me the easiest way is to draw the X and the Y axis of circles to make the seed pattern mm -hmm. and then just fill in the holes as you go around working your way out. So that, mm -hmm. I, I have an issue with that. With you the know, sunflower, sure. It also, yes. you know, and also it could have been a plus sign. <laughs> yeah, so. for all we know, it could have yeah. been a plus sign. It's plant math. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it, it is fairly indisputable, however, that these the women often are have these kind of religious symbols. And I think their theory is that this is a time in history where Christianity is kind of on the rise. True. And it's kind of a turbulent time for Christianity. True. Yeah. And that this could really easily be interpreted as like a pagan something. I think, you know, they're kind of... the Where they end their theory is that so these people put these... Christian religious things in there so that people would As know insurance. that it wasn't, yeah. yeah. So people would know it wasn't pagan. But, uh, but it insurance was policy. But it was pagan. Well, no, it was just, it was, uh, mm. just educational manual. Well, so, so, but, but you said that they said that it may have been a pagan manual or were they saying that it might have been mistaken for a pagan manual? That so the, they took, that the they author took and illustrator wanted to ensure that nobody would ever look at this and be like, this is obviously pagan witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that they were not pagan, mm -hmm. that they were Christian, and they were like, hey, don't worry, guys, 
this is totally a Christian thing. This is totally legit. Yeah. Totally legit, above board. Well, yeah, actually, if you're putting naked women in there, you probably want to you know, have some crosses and rosaries, too. Just, yeah, like totally, say, just yeah, to make just sure. Just to cover yourself, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, there was a, but there were, the nudity in, in art and illustration was not a was, frowned upon thing at mm-hmm. that time. It was no. the human form and the, the you know, females were yeah. always represented in that man. Yeah, yeah. There, were, so, there were no naked bike rides. That was kind of like beyond the pale. Yes, but, uh, that was, that yeah, was pushing the envelope. Paintings, yeah. So that's kind of the Tia's theory. Huh. It's interesting. Yeah. It only addresses that one little section. That's the problem. It only addresses one section mm-hmm. of the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and as opposed to, of course, they don't, they're not required to by law to, to you know, <laughs> well, describe guess, the, the astrological sections. You know, the that. astrological sections are, I guess, at that point, the only sections that they don't really address, right? Because it does address the biologic illuminations, right? Yeah, the pharmaceutical the stuff. And the yeah, pharmaceutical yeah. stuff as well. Mm-hmm. So it just doesn't address the star stuff. And, and, and that gives it some credence. Yeah. I, I, I can understand the theory. I understand it better now that you've explained it to me because when I read it, I didn't get it. You're welcome. But thank you. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I still I have qualms with it. And it's the same thing Joe said because it's really focused in one I area. I agree. Yeah. And yeah. I, again, as I said before, I think that you people see what they want to see. Yeah, and it. I can tell you that uh, one of the doctors, Tiaz, is apparently an accomplished watercolorist in plant life. Hmm. And yeah. they are both plant professors, basically. Either one of they're, them like they're pod a calligrapher. People? Neither of them is calligrapher. Oh, no. okay. But they are both. They're both biologic doctors. Biologic doctors? Yeah. Bi- Biologists. Biologists yeah. is the word I was looking for. Okay. Thank you. So they're, neither of them are linguistic professors. Which is why they, they avoid right. all of the language. Yeah. Okay, so, well, that makes sense. I, and I don't know if you know this, but uh, have they basically focused on the drawings and not really paid a lot of attention to the text itself? Yeah, they focused entirely on the drawings. And I, as far as I can tell, they are no longer researching and are no longer interested in researching yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a manuscript. It's kind of a hair puller, you know. I yeah. think uh, <laughs> a lot of people. You know, like, this paper that I read was published in I think two thousand two or something like that, and it's as been far a while. as I can tell. Yeah, that was that's like, the last time. That's the only thing they ever published about it. So, mm, yeah, interesting theory. Yeah, our next theory is the Nueva España theory or New Spain theory. Mm, and New Spain, New Spain, really? New Spain is. When the Spanish came to the New World yeah. and they they started taking over and conquering, they took over Mexico. 1492, they, right? Uh, a little bit after that. A little bit after that, yeah. yeah. And then they also started taking over parts of the continental U.S. Well, to them, that was they named it all... New Spain. Kind of like New York, huh? Yeah, basically, yeah. Mm. Or New Amsterdam, as it's it's called. Yeah. But yes. So that is what Nueva España means, is New Spain. And that's the area that it references. In, and New Spain really took up a lot of the center of the current United States. So it's mm. a very huge area. So this, the Nueva España theory is put out by two gentlemen. We've got Dr. Arthur Tucker and Mr. Rexford Talbert. And I had uh, some brief email correspondence with Dr. Tucker, and he was kind enough to send me their their research and their writing yeah. in a condensed format, but there's a lot to it. But let me kind of kind of boil down what their theory is. What these two gentlemen decided to do was rather than try to decipher the text right off, they did something similar to what the doctors Tiaz did. <laughs> the doctors Tiaz. Which is they focused on the illustrations. They wanted to try and figure out if they could f- pinpoint those illustrations to specific plants. And they didn't just focus on Europe. They went, they looked at plants that were known and had been discovered across all of the known world at that time. And we're Mm -hmm. talking the mid 1500s. What they found, and and, and they, when they, when I say the mid 1500s, that's when they think the manuscript was first quote unquote discovered. They don't believe it happened in the, uh, 
fourteen hundreds. Well, they're they're basing it off of plants that they knew were in the fifteen mid fifteen hundred range, mm-hmm. and that's and that's based on some other writings, which I'll get to in just a second. But what they did is they looked at the plants, and one of the ones that they found was called the soap plant. Oh. They they matched up the illustration in the description, the illustration to other books that were put out in this time range. The soap plant is depicted in the 1552 Codex Cruz Baranus of Mexico. And I might have mangled that pronunciation, but it's a book that came out of Mexico at that time. And it evidently is considered the first medical text that was ever written in the New World. Hmm. And And that was written by the Spanish? Yes, yes. And they took that and they said, wait, we've got these illustrations from that region of the world that seem to match this one plant. Let's try and match it to others. Which is not a bad way to do it. You know, let's not look at... I can't understand what the writing is, so let me see if I know what the pictures are. Yeah. That's how kids learn how to read, right? It it really is. I'm still working on that. (laughs) (laughs) According to their research, they have identified 37 plants, 6 animals, and 1 mineral in the manuscript to the Americas. How do they identify the mineral? That's what I'm curious about. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not exactly positive how they came to that conclusion, to be honest. I, I read their research, yeah. but it's a little above my pay grade, and so I didn't quite understand everything. Let's admittedly. be honest, this whole thing is above our pay grade. <laughs> yeah. really no, no, we're going to crack this one. Uh, but, Don't worry about but, it. But anyway, these plants were depicted in other writings from post conquest mexico and north america interesting so they're saying well we see these and we see those so we kind of draw the two together and say that it must have come out of that region of the world so are they, are they saying then that um plants in the new world are blobbier and lack perspective <laughs> <laughs> yes. don't know that they're saying that no but i guess my question would be that the the female figures right not to like drive Mm-hmm. Too hard on this, but they are very clearly very European. Yeah, and it's kind of Western European. It's uh-huh. not not what you see. The illustration style of Mexico and North America at that time, when the it's, Spanish had come, was very different. It's different, and that um, even just the illustration style of that time in Spain was Mm. totally, you don't see naked women from Spain in this period. In fact, you see like really covered in black clothing, very like morose women from Spain in this period. So I I wonder if they have a theory to kind of reconcile that. Of course, this is new Spain. Let's not forget. Well, (laughs) and that's exactly it because you got to remember that there's multiple cultures that have been conquered Mm. and they have different beliefs and they have a different way of doing things, and it may have been this weird melting pot. I guess, yeah. Mm. And, and here's here's something that they write, because they do try to address the text. They don't try and crack it, but they do try and address it. Yeah, what and, do you say? And I'm going to, yeah, let me read this directly here. A search of the surviving codices and manuscripts from Nueva España in the 16th century reveals the calligraphy of the Voynich Manuscript to be similar to the Codex Asuna, which is 1563 to 1566, evidently was written in Mexico City, mm. loan words for the plant and animal names have been identified from the classical, and I, again, I'm going to apologize on the pronunciation. Nahuati. How is that again? Nahuati. Or that Nahuatl. one? Nahuatl, I'm sorry. Nahuatl, yes. That, the Spanish... The Taino and mixed texts, which are all different cultures in that area, mm. so they they're kind. Of, it, to me, it sounds like it's we're we're melting them all together. Everybody's together, and the styles are all kind of shifting together. Mm. And eh, they're I, kind of similarities. I've got I got to say though, I, look, I took a look at the Codex of Suna, and uh, I didn't think the calligraphy was all that similar. <laughs> It's not, well, this is the issue. It's the same thing again. I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but we go back to Da Vinci. 
Yeah, this, the, the the style is the same, but everybody kind of used the same kind of writing mm. implement, which forces you to write in a similar manner. No, but they're not true. the same. I don't know. I kind of like the theory that like it's another relic of the Aztecs. And that's that's kind of where this points. They never, I, I never saw them come out directly and say this is a Aztec language derivative, uh-huh. but you really kind of get that sense mm-hmm. from I, the I, way they write about it. I see that, but again, the, the Codex Osuna was written by Spanish by by Spaniards. Uh huh. Correct, it not was. by Aztecs. Right. Right. And so you know, these guys actually took the trouble to to learn this this ancient written language of the Aztecs before they murdered him? Well, but if you think about not not every Aztec would have been killed. Mm -hmm. Some of them would have escaped either as slaves Mm -hmm. or free people Mm -hmm. who then got a job and they they pass this on to their children. You've got to hang on to your cultures as every every culture does. Teach it to your children so it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And some of that might have bled through. I got to tell you, I looked at uh, some of the some of the alphabets and and of the indigenous peoples like the Maya the Ma, the Mayans the the Olmecs and the Aztecs and they were basically they didn't seem to have a written alphabet so much as hieroglyphics mm-hmm. and so I mean I, I I don't know that there's any evidence that that any of the indigenous cultures here had any kind of writing system like this. But I, let's, ga- oh, I gotta go be ahead. honest, I think one of the most compelling theories in terms of who might have written this is that it was you know, like a slave language or mm. a like a gypsy roving caravan language because I, it's, it just kind of fits the parameters, right? It's a language that's trying to be, actively trying to be not what a lot of people are writing then. It's meant to be a private language, mm. but that it's written for a lot of people, but that it was a group of people that could have very easily been integrated into a different culture or died out. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's a very interesting idea. It is, uh, you know, but uh, you know, with all, with the, that theory, the problem I have with it is that there would be other remnants of sure. this yeah. language around, and s- instead of just this one thing. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I find that a little hard to believe. But that's also the hard part about history and especially areas that are in a lot of turmoil during history. Yeah. Think about all the, the relics from the past that have been burned and destroyed yeah. through yeah. wars. Yeah. Or Think fires about all the libraries or... that have been burned. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, know. these things, true. You know, we, people gather, oh my gosh, these are all the same. We've got to house them. We've got to protect them. And then somebody drops a lamp. And the whole thing goes up in smoke. Yeah. So it could be that they had they collected did. all this stuff and somebody was writing it. And they it was the interlibrary loan of the Aztec world and they sent it to somebody else. And then the entire library goes up in flames. Mm. And here's the one surviving copy of it. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, you know, I, I, you know, one thing I could conceive of is that uh, imagine an ancient surviving text from somewhere, something, something that's really, really old. And somebody, uh, like a monk, along about the 14th, 15th century, finds it, and it's kind of crumbling, and he thinks, you know, I've got nothing else going on in my life, my life. so I, I, you know, maybe what I'll do is I'm going to copy this whole thing over, even though I don't even quite understand it, copy the whole thing over, and just so it's preserved for posterity, mm-hmm. you know? And so maybe, the, maybe if this thing is actually real, which, you know, again, I'm not buying into that entirely, but maybe if it is, maybe it actually dates back a lot further. And somebody basically think. made copy. a hand copy of somebody it, and, it. Yeah. and that's the one we have. So that's we're we're we looking have. at a flawed copy, is what you're saying? No, it might it might it might be a meticulous copy, but it's a copy, so that means that number one, it's not going to be precise. Mm-hmm. It's not. Gonna it be, would it's be, not going to be a Xerox. Be, yeah, and it could be potentially you know thousands. That's of years what I'm saying. Older. It's yeah. it's something that could be much much older mm-hmm. than than the 14th or 15th centuries. Interesting. And yeah. that's that's a good theory. I I hadn't even thought about that before. I only thought about it just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, while while we're on crazy theories. Oh, let's go to crazy oh, yes. theories. Yes. I have one cuz I feel Woo-hoo! like that's like a little bit of a loony theory. Yeah. It's a good one. What, my theory? Yeah, I like I like the loony lunacy of it. Yeah. This one, however, I uh, That's even loonier. I shouldn't I shouldn't be cruel, right? I should be kind. But you are. But a little bit. Yeah. Let's so, have it. There's a guy. What's the guy's name? Vico Latvala. Latvala? Latvala, yeah. Uh, That's a crazy name. It's pretty crazy He must be crazy. Yeah. So he thinks that the Voynich manuscript details the spontaneous creation of DNA through the use of sound or a direct line from God. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I shouldn't makes, laugh. It all no, makes I'm sense. not making yeah. fun of any I, I, that. Keep going because this is where it gets. Well, worse. so basically, he thinks that this manuscript is not something to be deciphered. It is something to read and pray on and channel prophecy directly from God. Yeah. So he says it's religious text, basically. Yeah. So well, he... it's more than even a religious text. It sounds like it's kind of like, uh, it's like... the Ark of the Covenant. It's well, actually it channels enormous energies. Is right. That, no, I guess what how I would I, how I describe it is like when people speak in tongues. Mm. That it's like written in tongues almost, uh, right? Okay. And that like you could read it and pray on it and meditate on it. And if you were the special kind of chosen person by God, he would come down to you and say, oh, yeah, this is what it means. So he's actually using this method, has deciphered some of, us for, some of it for us. And I will read to you what he says it is. This is verbatim. And again, he deciphered this how? Just through uh, Just God? Just by praying on it and God oh, okay. telling him. All right. Because he's he's one of the worthy people. You know, I got to say that's a pretty cool and sacrament system. It's yeah. like uh, yeah, yeah, unbreakable. Okay, so the name of a flower is Heart of Fire. It makes the skin beautiful when made in ointment. The oil is pressed from the buds. The ointment is used for the wrinkles. It is suitable for the kidneys and the head. As the flower prevents inflammations, it is antibiotic. Plant is ten centimeters in its height. It grows hot and dry slants. The plant is bright green by its color. Ah, huh. and it's in Ethiopia. In mm. somewhere in Ethiopia. Hmm. Yeah. You're welcome, everyone. Well, you know, actually, I've got some wrinkles. I'm going to Ethiopia. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, plant. you know, the thing is, is like, believe what you want, but it's like, how hard is it to believe somebody who says, well, I am the only person... Mm-hmm. Who That's can decide for that? Yeah. Through the years, there's been a lot of charlatans that have come yeah. forward and said they had the translation. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to pitch a stone at this guy, but he seems to be part of that camp to me. That's uh, that's that's uh, kind of most likely. Yeah, it, it just seems too convenient. Yeah, the especially thing, for something that's so popular. The thing that I know about people who actually receive prophecies is that they don't go around screaming about it and they don't speak in the way that this guy is speaking, which is like, I'm so much better than you. I know everything. And this is what... So there's a little arrogance in there that you don't appreciate. That arrogance. Yeah. I think that like, you know, if you, okay, fine, whatever. You're going to receive a prophecy from God. Sure. It should come with a little humility. Yeah. That's actually, because Maybe think about don't it is, say you're the greatest person in the world. Well, exactly. Because <laughs> yeah, leave that to your, your followers to do. Because, and I've now set up a website where you can donate at. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I know, I mean, if, if I've got a direct line to God, I don't want to piss God off and, and, you know, queer that whole deal, you know. So I'm going to, I'm going to totally be, you know, humble, humble about the whole thing. I don't know. It's just a weird yeah, that's situation. that's a loody incoherent theory. What about uh, what about the the lizard people? Doctor Back suggested this theory. Yeah, he said one of. Well, the... somebody suggested. I guess to somebody him. suggested that's to mis- him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mis- yeah. Don't stop misrepresent him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he suggested this theory. Yeah, that there's uh, like subterranean lizard people. So, what do you think? This. Do you want to let him tell it? Yeah, let's let's have let's this let one. Tell it. He he had a pretty good take on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, a recent one, um, I, I actually appeared on Coast to Coast Radio, on, on US Radio, a few nights ago, and someone emailed me and suggested that they're convinced that the manuscript was written by lizard, lizards from outer space, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. living, inside, living inside the Earth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that was me. No, uh, <laughs> no just no, kidding. I, <laughs> no, I said to them, I hope not, because that means that we may, be, we may be somebody's lunch quite soon. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that that was that was one idea which I haven't seen before. <laughs> okay, well, so much for the lizard people. Uh, so next theory is that it's a hoax. Uh, there's a couple of a couple of different theories out there. One is that Voynich himself uh, wrote this, created this entire thing, and made it up that he bought it somewhere in Italy. And uh, I think that's kind of unbelievable because number one, why would anybody bother? But I mean, but more importantly, the age of the materials. Did he happen to stumble across some vellum and some ink that was like 500 years old? Yeah, Bax, I remember Bax had a pretty interesting take on this. Yeah, one. yeah he, Bax, he really did. Yeah, Dr. Bax did. Or illuminating. Let's, let's go to him. A few years ago, the um, Yale Library, which owns the manuscript now, um, they got some uh, people from the University of Arizona to look at the vellum and study it. So they, they took very tiny samples of the vellum from different parts of the manuscript. 
and they analyzed them and found that they're very consistent in their dating to around about 1420, 1430, with a certain range, of course, but definitely it's 15th century. And that threw out a lot of the other theories. There were theories that it was made in the 17th century or that it was a 20th century hoax and so on. But unless somebody kept a large amount of expensive vellum for hundreds of years without using it, which seems a bit unlikely, yeah. now, I, reckon yeah. it, I reckon it's a 15th century manuscript. And also the ink, they've analyzed the ink, and that's all entirely consistent with that date. There are no kind of modern chemicals in this and so on. So it seems to me that's one of the few things we can be pretty sure about, that it's a 15th century manuscript. Another theory is that it was a, a hoax by Roger Bacon, Sir Roger Bacon. Was he Sir? Well, he was a knight, wasn't he? Uh, yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. So Sir Roger Bacon, uh, some people have, have theorized that it was created by Roger Bacon. Bacon, as you know, is one of the original fathers of the scientific method, and uh, Voynich himself believed that Bacon wrote the book and that only Bacon would have the capability of doing so. The problem with this theory is that Bacon died in 1294, which is long before the book, the book was created. Wah, wah. Yeah, so that... Unless but, but, somebody was copying his work like you had suggested. That's and a possibility. Then it could have been Bacon. Somebody could have copied it, but it wasn't Bacon. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Bacon. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm oh. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, Bacon didn't do it. Uh, somebody, it could have been a hoax. Somebody could have done it. Somebody could have done this as a hoax. The reason I don't think it was a hoax is this. If Previously, I mentioned page 75, and, and I found other pages that have some, some re recurring words. So there's a word on here that I'll call golf cc 8 g so if you look at it, look at the... I would say it was an A, actually. Yeah? You think yeah. so? Yeah. Golf A83. Yeah, yeah. 89. So, uh, so this is what I was talking about that recurred a couple of times in the page that you wouldn't expect to in any sort of sophisticated If it was a cipher, cipher. right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, on the same page, this word appears like about 19 times. And I was noticing that. And small variations on the word. Uh, I, I've underlined them in different. The, the, the word itself I've underlined in orange, and, and the variations I've underlined in green. So have a look. Yeah, so it, so, looks, it looks a bit like there's the, the A, but also maybe it's like a C, but maybe it's like two C. So it's a question of like, yeah, is this a small variation? Is this just bad handwriting, variations mm -hmm. in handwriting? Uh, because they're all slightly different, but it looks to me like just differences in handwriting. I agree with that. So the word the think? word appears like many, many, many times on this page, and sometimes it appears one right after the other. Uh, and so if you're trying to, to concoct a convincing hoax, um, especially if you're Sir Roger Bacon, a smart guy, then you're not going to do something as stupid as this unless you have utter contempt for your, the people you're trying to fool. Uh, and, and I think it goes for pretty much any hoaxer that you're not going to repeat the word 40 times on a single page. Steve looks really depleted. Well, uh, and, and, I, and I, I know Joe and I briefly discussed this, is I see in the words that you've pointed out mm. some similarities, mm. but they're, they're not identical to me. And yeah. when I look at them, let's, say, let's just call it the last three characters. Mm -hmm. Are seem to be relatively consistent with the small variants, but let's just call them consistent. Yeah. But I don't see that that means it's the same word. To me, it's the same thing as having ing mm -hmm. at the end of something. So the, the I am first... seeing, being, believing. Mm -hmm. Those all end in so, the same. I so guess take... for me to like take Joe's side on this, the first part looks really really similar in all mm -hmm. those words there's just the middle like one or two letters depending on the word that mm -hmm. are a little different and i think that like okay so right believing 12 times in a row it's not going to look the exact no same. it's not no. going to look identical you're absolutely yeah. right and so that's what i think we're seeing is small handwriting variations and what and I, I i know that that you're looking at these and some of these i'm i'm looking at the same page as you are mm -hmm. and i don't think that they are identical and and let me mm. just just explain why okay is if you look at words that are written in an older handwriting or even typesetting style you can see let's say the letter f mm -hmm. there's what's known as a ligature where two letters are joined so if you have mm -hmm. an ff 
Yeah. It can be just right lowercase, lowercase, right next to each other. Or there's a ligature where the Fs are actually connected to make what looks like one character, but in a, it is one character mm-hmm. in a typesetting perspective. I, I've but seen it's, but, that in but they're text, they're two different. Yeah. Some of those look like the the cross of what we're saying is the F of golf. Mm-hmm. Sometimes to be, seems to be short and contained. Sometimes seems to come across the L. And I I don't disagree that maybe that is just handwriting. But to me, in a way, I almost wonder if they are different and distinct characters. I'm not dis, I'm not mm. you know disavowing what you're saying. I just I see intricacies in the letter forms that I don't know mean that they're the same, but. It's yeah. handwriting. It's hard to say. Yeah, it is hard to say. But I have just drawn on this. You did draw on it. Yeah. Do you know how much that's worth? Yeah. I know, I know. This I've is, just I, drawn I, I on this original. I stole this out of the collection. <laughs> I've been going over it with a highlighter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mail it back to them when we're done with this. The way that the, the author forms the A, mm-hmm. kind of, it's kind of like two Cs. Mm-hmm. And I just drew on there. Joe's looking at it right mm-hmm. now. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's like, I think that that's just handwriting. Like this yeah. one here, for example, uh, there's two C's, but they're sort of like the second Very C close. is drawn. It's so close, it almost looks like they're one character, but I, yeah. I think they're two C's. Uh, this, this is and, not And, and, and this is podcasting. why this has been going on for uh, at yeah. least a hundred years that we know of yeah. for sure, if not three yeah. or four. Yeah, I know, exactly. But, but, but what I'm saying is that, like, as far as the hoax thing goes, the fact that this same word, and it appears to me to be the same word, um, let's so and, Steve, let's just accept and let's, that it's but, the same okay. word. Well, I'm going to run with it. Okay. Let's, but you know, let's just accept that if you're doing a hoax, you're not going to do words that look exact, look, look very, very similar to the word right next to them, yep. over and over again in your text. You're not going to do that because you want to, you want to have a really convincing hoax. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is not the way to do it. So obviously, these these people were either very incompetent hoaxers or it was not a hoax. All right, well, so much for the hoax. We've conclusively proven it's not a hoax. <laughs> and so, well, not exactly. Because, I mean, actually, if you're a hoaxer, you're probably, you're probably kind of convinced that your readers are lazy. You're not going to get past the third page. <laughs> yeah. And this they're just going to gloss yeah, over and over and they're over. They're just going to sort of glance at it, look at the pictures, especially the naked bodies, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So it That's maybe... the blah, blah, blah. We should note that the words that we were just talking about are literally right next to a pool with a bunch of naked women in it. Yeah. Yes. So... On to our next theory. The next theory is it's just gibberish. Uh, Gordon Rugg, a British psychologist, uh, says that there's a case that it might just be entirely made up and just gibberish. Uh, He published a paper in 2004 saying that it's a hoax, most likely, and uh, he had come up with a system that uh, uses a grill of words, basically. So he's got three tables side by side, uh, prefix, root suffix and then a, a piece of cardboard that's got three little rectangles cut in it you, you move this thing around on there and wherever you light upon you get three you know one or two characters for the prefix and maybe three for the root and one or two for the suffix you just copy those down onto a manuscript and then move it copy the next set down copy the next set down you can get up you can come up with a, a gibberish system that is very consistent and kind of convincing, and so hmm. and so that and uh, so he, basically, he he made up gibberish language to prove that though this looks like regular language, mm-hmm. it's just hooey, or it mm-hmm. could be. It's a, it's a. Uh, he he also named the suspect, which was Edward Kelly, was a con artist. Uh, ah, yeah. Edward Kelly. Yeah. I've uh, not heard of Kelly. Yeah, he. Uh, if you're one of our listeners, you might want to do a Google on this. There's a language that Ed- Edward Kelly and this other guy created. Uh, Andreas Schinner, I believe, was him. Uh, they created a language they called Enochian, which is spelled E-N-O-C-H-I-A-N. He was he and, was close friends with Queen Elizabeth the first. Yeah. Just throw that out there. Yeah, Enochian. So Enochian is uh, it, there's there's a wiki on it. And you can read all about it. It doesn't the the characters don't look like this, but it, it's it's entirely conceivable that this guy maybe could have made up another bogus language besides Enochian. Uh, so, uh, b- but besides fraud, I mean, we're back into the fraud thing again. Uh, uh, another theory is that it's gibberish because it was just basically somebody who was autistic. Did this, and so some somebody was just like uh, just 
sat down with, you know, he's maybe from a wealthier family, so they actually had some vellum and ink for him to write with. So if you're a peasant, you probably don't have that. And, uh, or maybe he was an autistic monk, and he just wrote a lot of gibberish and drew a lot of weird uh, drawings mm. and stuff. And I think that uh, the autistic, uh, based, on my, based on my looking at uh, some of these pages, and I'm going to show you guys another one here. On page 75, we saw the recurrence of a particular word, in my opinion, and, and Devin's, I think, many times. And you get along to page 80. It's another one I randomly, randomly selected. And the, the, the word of the day on that one is one that I call Golfa, G-O-L-F-A-W. And that appears many, many times on this page. Uh, the other one, um, um, Golf CCAG, appears on here too, but it seems to not appear quite as much. Yeah, which would suggest to me that somebody who is possibly autistic and somebody uh, who's a little OCD, he'll fixate on a set of characters and reproduce those over and over again until another one comes along that catches, sort of catches his interest and. He starts writing those. I can see that. I, that I that think, makes sense. And it, it's not, and, and, and we've and, seen things like that in, in you know, today. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and the fact, and the fact of the matter is, is that I can't think of any comprehensible language, any language that we know about, that would have this kind of repetition in it. This is not. I I don't believe that this is language. I think it's gibberish. Hmm. And I and I'm so I'm basically what I'm putting forth is the autistic monk monk theory. Hmm. Yeah. I can see that, and, I, and I'm not going to disparage that at all. Mm. What I do wonder, though, is if we look at this, some people have said, well, this is a scientific manual of some kind. Mm -hmm. And have any, have any of you ever cracked open a biology book, mm -hmm. and you'll see the Latin name followed with a derivative that's more of a general name, and you'll see that word every couple of words in there, you know, it's the genus, blah, 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 genus, blah, 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 genus, blah, 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 genus in different variants. Mm -hmm. So I almost wonder if it's, let's just say it was the soap plant because that was in the, the New Spain theory, is it's the soap plant, something, something, soap plants, plural, and then something, something, soap planting, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm just spitballing here, but I could see why that repetition might be in there. Mm -hmm. For that one, because they're referencing it specifically over and over. And I, mm -hmm. I know that what people prescribe as the names of the plants on the pages aren't the words that you're pulling out. But I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm looking at it and I'm wondering if maybe that's a possible reason well, for this frequency that you're to, seeing. to further that, right, if we're going to take like the Latin name of a plant, some Latin, Latin names of plants are this word repeated this word, right? Like Brutus mm. Brutus or something. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not yeah, it's, it's possible. Legit. It's, it's, you know, it so that possible. would help explain why it'd be like in succession. I mm. honestly, like, just throw that out there. Don't mm -hmm. know where I land on this theory. Yeah. I'm somewhere between the two of you. Well, I, I, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I have not had a chance to review um, a, tr a, a huge amount of this manuscript. I'll probably look at some more of it. Um, I'm not going to devote my life to it. <laughs> I haven't had that much time. So I went out and basically randomly picked some pages and just started looking at, looking at stuff and looking at patterns. And so I started noticing re repetition in the words. And, and once you and, point it out, I see it. Yeah. And um, so I would encourage our listeners to go out and look at page 75 and page 80 and look, at, look for the repetition. But also look at other pages. But also look at other pages and tell us what you think. Tell us what you think about, about the theory. See if you find a similar sort of pattern of repetition of words over and over again, which would kind of support the theory that I think. And it's not true crowdsourcing here. Uh, <laughs> so to support my theory that this was some person with OCD or a person with autism who... Uh, was sat down in a little room somewhere with some vellum and some ink and just did his thing. Just and obsessed over yeah, the over yeah, and yeah. just kept yeah, doing it over yeah, and, and over. And, yeah. yeah, and so uh, there is another theory. Uh, this, is, uh, this is also from page 75. There's a four-letter grouping that appears repeatedly. Also, in some of the words that we've talked about, like, say, golf, C-C-8-G. It's a four, the first four letters of that word which really do look to to my eyes like golf, G O L F. Yeah, they, they look, really uh, do. They do. Appear, now that you've said it, appear many, many times in that page. I can just imagine ancient plaid shorts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or you know, as we saw recently, PBR shorts. Yeah. So anyway, take a look at that. Tell me what you think. Uh, would you agree that it appears there a lot? 
Oh, yeah. But I guess for me, I there are a lot of languages in this world that instead of doing like ing like we do, right? Yeah. Do a prefix like That's that. That's possible too. Right. But... Is, doesn't Arabic do a, something like that? No, nah, it, it's on a, it's a suffix in Arabic. But, oh, it uh, is. Uh, no, anyway, but if you look at it, though, it does look like golf, which leads me to believe that this was actually a uh, text written by a, a medieval golf pro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a manual yeah. of golfing <laughs> yeah. and plants to avoid. Yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. And, 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 and in this particular spot, he's got the naked chicks on the, on the golf green. Do you see that? It's green and they're yeah. naked. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh. And so, yeah. I That's think how you it, distract your rivals at the yeah, game. Yeah. yeah. So it's a medieval golf pro. So. All right. Do we have any other theories? We do. Uh, oh, well, another one? We do. We do. We have, I think we have one more. It's just the, the one more left, which is opening the gates to Crazy Town. We talked about the lizard people a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of people are putting forth that they think that this is a book written in an alien language by an alien people. Mm-hmm. Who have left it for us to teach us what I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, you know what? I gotta be honest with you. I am so glad that our listeners like that we hate the alien theories. <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's the thing about the alien <laughs> theory. And this, this, I actually, this is pretty interesting. When you get into, is it the, I think it's the cosmological section mm-hmm. where there's kind of what seems to be almost like celestial bodies. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's illustrations that appear to be the Milky Way galaxy, the spiral of the Milky Way. Yeah. And they also appear to be the Andromeda galaxy. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and the thing is, we can because we have the technological capabilities. We have now, the technology. We have the technology well, we to better, look smarter, at these faster. galaxies. We can see what they look like. Yeah. The problem is, is that if this was written in the early to mid 1400s, mm-hmm. we didn't have the technology to see that. No, we didn't were... have eyes. Yeah, the, no. The, no, the telescope to be able to to focus on a galaxy oh. that is so far away, or to have something that could see our own galaxy. Oh. we didn't have that. I mean, yeah, the, 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 yeah. the regular telescope using lenses that came about in the 1600s. Is that um, about right? I, I think thought... I think even earlier than that, but I mean. But it Even wasn't of uh, such as, a high quality that you could you could see a blob. Yeah, exactly. At the time that this was written, um, people were already looking at Andromeda. It, mm-hmm. had been, it had already been noted, but yeah, you couldn't make out the spiral arms. Of right. The you, it, we didn't. Like we that. couldn't clear. We couldn't get the clarity. Oh no. So no. that's where people that's... say, well. We did. We couldn't see it that well to note all that detail to then draw and record that, Therefore, which means that somebody else was out there and able to see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean Galileo was around in like the late 1500s. Mm-hmm. I guess I don't know how accurate carbon dating is. I don't know how sure we are about this stuff. That is the hard part. You know, like that's within a hundred years. I feel like that's maybe within the margin of error. But no, Galileo, I don't think ever ever made out the spiral arms of Andromeda. No, yeah. he personally probably not, but yeah. but that's a, that's a high like, level of detail. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, but also, who's to say? I am apparently playing devil's advocate on this one. Today you are. Yeah. Apparently, who's to say that that wasn't just like a artistic license? Exactly. Somebody just made up a spiral. So the the spiral, um, I, and I missed this particular port, this particular illustration. Is it a spiral as seen from above, or is it you know, at sort of an oblique angle? Uh, like it's from above. Yeah, exactly. It's from above. Yeah, exactly. So, so it, it could so it very could be. easily be people, again, seeing what they want to see and yeah. applying it to what we now know. Yeah, exactly. And so the aliens might have shared with us the Andromeda, or you know, our, we also live in a spiral galaxy. Mm-hmm. And so the aliens, might that might be a, a depiction of our own galaxy. Okay, you know, I, uh, Devin just held up a picture of it to me. This is obviously a garden. Uh, it's, it's obviously a sketch. It looks a bit like a, a labyrinth. Plant. Yeah, it's, it's a plant for a garden. Okay, no galaxy. Never mind. Ancient yeah. and landscape architect at well, work. It, it might have been that the aliens came down to us and and uh, basically bought, brought us tributes of shrubbery. 
I maintain that this looks like... Hey, I just pulled up an, another picture of it, of course. But I maintain that it looks a lot like a video game map of the world. <laughs> or yeah, like... Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know, like a blueprint for buildings or something. I mean, yeah, it's, you yeah, know, it's, it could be a lot of things. Yeah. We the, kind it, of say, oh, it's stars, but. Uh, and again, yeah. with something where you don't know what the hell the text is describing, I can make it anything I want. This, Absolutely. This is why I like the approach that Dr. Bax is taking so much. Because he's trying to figure out the words because he, to then figure out what they are. He has been presented, right, with so many different theories about like, oh, maybe this person wrote it. Maybe it's about this. And he keeps saying, that's very interesting, but I'm going to approach the text. Yeah, linguistically. A smart move. Because you can yeah. say, you guys, the minute you say, this is about biology, you start to decode the text, and it's about biology. Mm -hmm. Because you can make it be whatever you want it to be. Yeah. So, again, that's why I think like his approach is really the most interesting and probably yeah. the, the, the best approach is, that we good. have right now. Yeah, though, I, uh, Dr. Bax, if you're listening, please look at pages 75 and 80. <laughs> <laughs> Before you spend too much more time on this, yeah. um, I'm a little disturbed by what I see there. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I, 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 the I feel kind of bad about this. I've been pretty busy lately, and I didn't have time to start attacking this until pretty recently. And I, and I, if I had had more time, I would have been looking at more pages to find more of this stuff. But that's what our listeners are for. They're going to go out and do this. Well, and, and so. that's what the last couple of hundred years of people trying to figure it out before you mm. have also been doing. So there's a ton of legwork already done for us. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, does anybody else have any last minute theories to, to put out on this one before we put it to bed? No. Uh, pod people? No, 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 no. Nope. Let's see. Uh, perfect spheres? No. The Tyler? Oh. No, it's definitely not him. So, okay. what, which, uh, Joe, what you believe that it's gibberish? Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that it's gibberish uh, written by an autistic person, most likely. Okay, Devin, how about how about you? Where where do you fall on this? I I honestly don't fall anywhere on this. I think that, you know, as I was just saying, that Doctor Bax's approach is kind of probably the most solid approach. Is uh -huh. that you just kind of have to say, ah, but let's see if we can decipher the text. Although I do like the theory that was floated in the AMA that it was this like family that wrote this thing. They were all really smart. It has kind of Hindi flares. Mm -hmm. It might have been Italian. But 99% of me says, I don't know. Got it. Well, I, I, I also really, I like the direction that Dr. Max is going. Mm -hmm. It seems the most solid and concrete. I also appreciate the different approach that Dr. Tucker took with yeah. the Nueva España. Mm -hmm. That seems to have some credence. I see holes in it, but I see holes in just about everything that's done. Yeah. And so I, I unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not settled on one particular theory. I see things that I like that are promising. And that's as mm. far as I'm willing to go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that's ladies and gentlemen, is. if you have any theories. I'm sure you do. Then we would love to hear from you. There's, uh, If you want to see any of the research that we've got, and we'll put up a bunch of this research. There's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll co-mingle like it. Three hours. Yeah, 17 hours later, yeah. we're done recording. Uh, we will put up a bunch of the links. Those links are going to be on our website. As always, that is going to be thinkingsidewayspodcast.com. You can listen to the episodes while you're on the website. Uh, I know a lot of people are doing that. And then some people like to download them. And a lot of people go to iTunes to get those. If you're on iTunes, go ahead and take the time to subscribe. Leave us a comment and rating if you get the chance. Uh, a lot of folks are leaving comments on the website as well, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. You can always get us on Stitcher. So if you don't have the time to go to the, you don't not able to get the website and you use Stitcher from any mobile device, you can stream the episodes right there. We're on Facebook, 
So you can find us, you can like us. Uh, at the suggestion of a listener, we recently created a Facebook group for our listeners to get together and chat about stories, stuff like that, which seems to slowly be building a little momentum. Ah, how's that so going? Is, is there a lot of people it's, joining it's, in on that? It's starting to gain some momentum. It's a little oh. slow right now, but it's oh. brand new. We haven't new. told anyone about it yet, though. So oh, yeah. Is, that's, that's exactly the problem. Yeah. Is that's not a lot a of people point. know. Okay, now you know. Yes, now they Facebook know. Group. Uh, and... If you want to go ahead and tell us your theories, you could just write us an email. That email address is thinking sideways podcast at gmail.com. We try to respond pretty quickly. P- pretty quickly, yeah. We us? try to stay up on top we of try. it. It's not always us. Usually it's an intern, but <laughs> uh, yeah. He loves the idea of an intern. Yeah. Uh, but no, we do try to get back to everybody as quickly as possible. And, and I know there's a few folks who probably haven't gotten a reply yet. And that's I apologize. We've just been a little swamped with this story. But we will get and to plus you. We all, yeah, we all have jobs. Too. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's but not, uh, that having easy. been said, that is the, the mystery of the Voynich Manuscript. It's Solved. a lot of information. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us for the whole time. I, it's a lot. I understand. But hopefully you've gotten some of the things that you hadn't heard before. Because that's what we're trying to do is get you as many as we can. Exactly. I feel like I feel like we should put an Easter egg in for all the people who made it to this point. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, Easter We're egg. awesome, and so are you. That's a good one. Maybe you're right. a fi or were. <laughs> 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 all right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot. We'll talk to you next week. And you're special. It's just so special. <laughs>